What if we told you that you're probably sitting in the same room as one of the dirtiest climate polluters in the world? In fact, you're probably looking at this ticking environmental time bomb right now. Our cell phones have become our connection to the world, but they might also be poisoning the world with their carbon emissions and the ecological damage it takes to make them. Cell phones alone contribute 125 megatons of CO2 every single year. And up to 95% of these emissions are made before your cell phone is even in your hand. Because it takes a ton of energy to create your phone's materials and put them all together. Not to mention all the energy and resources needed to mine the rare minerals that make your phone work. A standard Apple iPhone has about 300 milligrams of silver, 30 milligrams of gold, 15 milligrams of palladium, and less than one thousandth of a gram of platinum. USA Today predicts that last year alone, Apple sold 195 million iPhones. 195 million in one year. That's just a staggering amount of phones. And that's just one product from one brand. And once you buy your phone, it takes energy to operate. Experts say that information and computer technologies, which includes things like computers, data centers, and cell towers, contribute 860 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions a year. And then after two years, your cell phone provider is pushing you to get a new phone. So even though the average lifespan of a cell phone is five years, most users ditch theirs after only two to three years and the EPA estimates less than a fifth of those phones get recycled. That's millions of phones added to landfills every year, where they can leach toxic pollutants like lead and mercury into our water streams. Which is absolutely crazy, because remember those rare minerals we mentioned? If you count it all up, we're throwing away over $55 billion in rare minerals every year in cell phones that probably didn't need to be replaced in the first place. And while some groups are working on ways to safely extract those minerals from old phones, other e-waste processors have prioritized economic gain over the long-term environmental impact of leaching these minerals, leaving nearby soil, water, and air dangerously polluted. Only 15 to 20 percent of e-waste around the world is recycled appropriately. And in the U.S., that could be because of this. Three in five young Americans have no idea what e-waste even is. What's more, 40% of young Americans don't know how to dispose of electronic waste properly. We spoke to Miami-Dade County's Department of Solid Waste Management to see how to properly discard cell phone-related items and to see what is their likelihood of getting recycled. Let's start with phones. They are recyclable, but with the big caveat. It is recyclable, but it's not recyclable in uh, the curbside. In other words, in the uh, cart that people place out on the street, you don't want to put it there. Instead? There's a place, uh, an organization called uh, Call to Recycle, but they will take cell phones. They have, in fact, they have drop boxes all over uh, in different retail locations across the country. Next, removable phone batteries. But where we are, our program, we will accept the battery with the cell phone. But again, don't put it in the blue recycling bin. Check your local waste management agency's website to find out where you can drop it off. How about headphones and phone chargers? We'll take it when our residents bring in their uh, old cell phones, they can bring in the charger with you know, the cable. Uh, most of those cables have some type of metal, usually copper, uh, that's recyclable and, uh, and actually a little bit valuable. But again, don't put them in the recycling bin. Exactly, we don't want it there because it'll tangle up the machinery, but we will take it with our e-waste. What about your plastic phone case? Okay, phone cases are a little bit more complex. In our curbside program, it's not acceptable, uh, but there are a few places, at least, uh, you do have to search online, but there are a few places you can find that will take the uh, case um, and recycle it. Finally, what about those plastic screen protectors? Uh, plastic film is a little bit trickier to recycle. Definitely not in, in our curbside program, and I'm, I imagine most curbside programs. And one more time for the people in the back, don't put any of this in the blue bin. Most of us have an old cell phone laying around collecting dust. Or worse, we've committed a huge environmental no-no and thrown an old phone in the trash. But just because a phone isn't the latest model or even has a cracked screen, doesn't mean it should be destined for the landfill. 
The 911 cell phone bank provides emergency cell phones to law enforcement for use in their victim services programs uh, and for senior citizens. So if uh, a victim of abuse has to leave quickly, can't take their cell phone with them, they have a way to communicate with the police. James Mosier started 911 cell phone bank in 2004 after the Harriet Tubman organization came to him with a bunch of old cell phones people had donated and they weren't quite sure what to do with them all. So several years ago, the FCC made, uh, mandated that even cell phones that are not active or don't have service, don't have a phone on, number on them, have to be able to dial 911 in an emergency. And uh, because of that, uh, these devices that are not active can be used by victims in emergency circumstances. I recall one uh, situation where um, a, a, a woman's abuser had been arrested and uh, he, he, there, an order of protection had been given. He was arrested, with, but he, he told his uh, girlfriend, this woman, before he went into jail, he said, when I get out, I'm going to kill you. So uh, one of the uh, counselors there, the victim advocates, gave her an emergency phone that you know, that she could keep with her. Um, there were a couple of uh, the detectives that were like, that's not going to do anything. That's not going to help. Well, how is an unactivated cell phone going to help this woman? Well, that night, her abuser came and he physically cut the telephone lines to her house. So thinking that she had no way of communicating, he tried kicking the door in. She got the phone, dialed 911, and uh, they got there in time to arrest the man and to save this woman's life. The 911 cell phone bank has processed over 1 million cell phones since it started just 15 years ago. And the source of a lot of these phones might surprise you. We get the phones from individuals. We get them from uh, companies. We get them from police departments, property and evidence rooms. Well, we get a lot of phones from uh, lost and found departments. So in other words, a, a casino or a resort or hotel, if someone lo leaves a phone behind, it ends up in their possession. If they can't find the owner, um, sometimes they don't know what to do with it. Well, here we come. <laughs> we'll be glad to take those devices off their hands. Mosher has donated over 150,000 cell phones to people and organizations in need which is 150,000 cell phones that went to helping people or saving lives instead of just sitting in a landfill. Knowing that we have had an impact on someone's life, of course, is very, very rewarding. We get every, uh, I say every day at least, we get one thank you from, uh, you know, from someone that has been helped by this uh, emergency, emergency phone by our program. And uh, some, have been lifesavers, literally. Some people's lives have been saved by the devices that we've provided. Right now, it's an iPhone frenzy at Brea Mall where thousands of people are still waiting. How did we become such a phone-obsessed world? More than 15 million people upgrade their mobile phone each year, leaving a mountain of unwanted handsets. At the start of World War I, there was one working telephone for every 10 people in the United States. Fast forward to today, and there is an average of 1.3 phones for every person in the country. So how did we go from this to this? Prior to World War II, landlines dominated the country. It wasn't until the 80s that we saw the first commercially available handheld cell phone. But it wasn't very affordable. Its price tag, $4,000. And it wasn't very popular. It wasn't just cell phones that were expensive. Making calls was too. In 1960, a three minute call from New York to San Francisco cost the equivalent of $12 today. But when AT&T's monopoly over the phone industry was broken up in the 80s, new players came into the game, allowing cell coverage to increase and the cost of calls to drop. But cell phones were still not indispensable. Most people could be reached by mail and landline. In 1999, everything changed. Nokia did something no other cell phone manufacturer had done at the time. In a pitch to get younger people to buy cell phones, Nokia's lead designer, Frank Nuovo, challenged his team to reimagine the phone not as a utility, but as a fashion statement and a toy. His designers came up with this, the Nokia 3210. 
also known as the candy bar. It let you talk, send really short texts, and play Snake. It hid the antenna that dominated phones at the time, and it was so small it fit comfortably in your pocket. But this was what catapulted it to success, customizability. Users could buy custom covers to reflect their personality, and it was so popular, 160 million of them were sold worldwide in 2000, officially cementing Nokia as the preeminent cell phone maker in the world. In the early 2000s, cell phones got smarter, cheaper, faster, and cooler. There was the Razer, the Sidekick, the Blackberry, a library of hardware so diverse anyone could find something they liked. But in 2007, a computer company in Cupertino, California, changed the cell phone game again. These people have been lining the streets of New York for days, not for theatre tickets, free beer, or even money. It's to buy this. Instead of focusing on hardware, Apple decided to focus on software, releasing the world's first iPhone and setting the stage for what cell phones are today. Many computers that let you send emails, find a restaurant, and even love, making cell phones indispensable devices that are an extension of our social lives. Today, the average American gets their first phone at 11, 96% of Americans own a cell phone of some kind, and 63,000 is the number of text messages sent every second in the US. No word on how many of those are left on road. So what can you do to curb your electronic waste? Here are a few tips. Number one, repair. Instead of getting a new phone every two years, try repairing it. There are organizations like iFixit that are crowdsourcing user-generated repair manuals and tutorials to empower everyday people to fix their phones. Number two, buy used. Buying a refurbished or certified pre-owned phone creates 80% less waste than buying a new one. And while they run virtually as smoothly as a new model, they can be about 25% cheaper too. Three, buy green. You can purchase eco-friendly phone cases and even environmentally friendly spray-on screen protectors. Liquid that you wipe on the, the cover, let it dry for a couple minutes, and it's supposed to be as good as uh, plastic screen cover, so. Number four, throw away responsibly. Big box retailers, like Best Buy, have bins where you can drop off old chargers. You can also call your local high school STEAM program to see if they have need for old cables. And if you're going to recycle your phone, look for this e-steward symbol on the recycler's website. That means they meet the safest, cleanest standard for e-cycling. And finally, vote for less e-waste. Only 25 states have some kind of legislation banning disposable electronic waste at landfills. And 32 US states currently have bills drafted to require phone manufacturers to allow consumers to repair devices without having to go through expensive authorized repair centers. But they're just that right now, drafts of bills, and need constituent pressure and votes to become law.